So I'm going to invite Ronnie up. So we are going to uh, continue our Matthew series. And uh, this was, I'm pretty sure this was James's idea uh, to come up with this format for this morning. Uh, Ronnie has talked a lot about uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, over the past 25 years to a lot of our, our people, and, uh, and so it, it struck James as he was preparing and building the outline for this that it'd be neat to have Ronnie uh, come and talk, and so James came up with a, a list of questions, and we gave those to Ronnie. Uh, he has a, a book, and I'll let him talk about this in a second, but he has a, a book that kind of highlights the Sermon on the Mount uh, that might be a good um, read for us in here if you want to pick that up. Did you bring copies? I only had two, but... Okay, I'm sure it's Joy's fault. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's, I ask her to order it. Yeah. Okay. You can, you can't read, so that's just all, all we got. Joy has become my target, hasn't she? Pam's like, I love it. I love it. Keep at it. Keep at it. So yeah. No. Um, but anyway, this is this is going to be a new format for us. We did this out at the retreat, and uh, it's just an opportunity for us to have a little bit of a dialogue and conversation, and for for you to come along with us in that process. Uh, so I think that's it. Anything else, James, I need to mention here before we get going? Okay. All right. Let's do it. Good morning, sir. Good John morning, Bonrunnen. sir. Nice to meet you. See you again. Um, okay. So what would you, uh, and just kind of set a little bit more of a backdrop. We've been in Matthew. We came through the first three chapters kind of leading into Jesus' baptism at the end of chapter three. And then the, you know, can you guys, do you guys remember what happened in the desert? What, what happened to him? He was tested, yes. And so we talked about that last week. And, uh, and so this week we're jumping into the uh, Sermon on the Mount, which uh, spans chapters 5 through 7. And so what would you uh, just say to us kind of to get started about the Sermon on the Mount and things that, you know, structurally as we look over the next few weeks, it would be good for us to keep in mind? Would you mind if I turn this chair around and kind of lean on no. the back? Yeah. I want to see people. and. Okay. There's several in the back that I know that will talk if I'm not kind of looking at them. So. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to sit there and face backwards. I was, I was super confused. Well, there were probably some people hoping I would. But, um, yeah, I, um, I started, I grew up like a lot of people in America. We went to church and so forth. Our mom was our, um, our spiritual leader, and, and she got sick, and died and that kind of threw a whole made things even worse than they were before but so when I went to college the one thing I was was a serious student and that's kind of what I had and my sophomore year in college though even that kind of went sour on me it's like I it kind of lost a lot of meaning and and so just trying to figure out you know what life is about what what is their worth living for? Because my life, my number one memory of growing up, overarching everything else, was being pretty miserable a lot of times and sad and other things like that. And so, and, and, I, and I was talkative enough and I listened to people enough to realize I wasn't alone in that. <laughs> there was a lot of that. Um, so I went to church to try to just look into God. I didn't have a faith. The little faith that I had as a kid was pretty well gone. And um, I had a lot of doubt. And so um, it was hard wading through church coming to faith because church really, there was no place in the church I was a part of to help you come to faith. And there was no place to just come clean with what had happened to me and what I was, was struggling with even. And a lot of the things that we do as a family of churches are built on that to try to ask early and often, what you got going on? What do you need help with? Uh, because most people that come from outside particularly are reapproach God are desperate. So... I was, I was looking for a lot of, of answers early on, and so I, I thought all the Christians at church were that way. I thought everybody was studying and was serious, and so I, uh, you know, I got my first Bible, and I had to get a dic new dictionary to go with it. It was the King James Version, and I had no idea about a lot of those words. We didn't speak that in Tussie, Oklahoma, so, uh, so it, it was very difficult for me, and um, 
I started reading through Genesis and I really got bogged down in Leviticus. I'm sure some of you probably have done that before and it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to destroy my faith if I've got any. Uh, It was just too difficult and too weird and I'm too raw and honest about stuff. And it's like, this is just nasty. Um, Especially when I looked up what some of those words meant. I thought, this is really gross. But there's several writing down, read Leviticus, you know, it's, it, is, it is pretty nasty, but, um, and I'm being a bit facetious here, it's an outside perspective when you don't know what's going on, this is, you're reading the word of God, and then suddenly this stuff is coming out, it's like, um, so I went to the New Testament. I started going to a little uh, Christian student center that was across from campus shortly after, probably two months after I started visiting church. And um, it was very small. And I got elected vice president of the group, which I let them do. I think there were only three guys there. And, um, and so I got elected vice president in that setting. No girls could... could uh, could, could be an officer, and so it had to be guys. And I thought, well, vice presidents don't do anything. And that was uh, one of the first God deals in my life is that God uh, snookered me. So uh, I, w- I would never be president of anything um, because I didn't want to do anything uh, like that. I, just, I didn't like politics. I didn't like any of that scene. But the vice president was in charge of getting the speaker, not for one devotional week, but for two and I only found out after the appointment and all. I thought, oh. Um, but very quickly, I didn't get anybody, and I knew it was coming up, so I sat down and wrote. I'd started reading the Gospel of Matthew. And, of course, you immediately encountered the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and I was in a fundamentalist church, and I can't tell you that it didn't, you know, uh, drive me crazy because it didn't make sense to me. I did not know the gospel. Uh, I had not been taught the gospel. And the church I went to was not very gospel-centered at all. Uh, It was probably not unlike a lot of the fundamentalist churches. It's, here's the rules, here's the thing, do this, do that. And, And those were good things to do, but for someone that had lots of secrets and felt really lost, um... It didn't help. I mean, you hit that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's like, well, I'm out of here. I don't, how does it, how do you do this? So, but it did put me in that. The first devotional I did though was after reading the gospel of Matthew, I wrote along uh, and I read it to them. It was on legal pages and basically the thesis was I've been reading the gospel and the church doesn't look much like Jesus. And that's how I felt. And I still feel that way a lot of times. And I don't think it's the average member's fault. I think Satan is really good at power structures in churches, at corrupting things. And we just get in this mode of... of, um, of um, just missing God in it all. Um, So, I think what has helped me, and I've been studying now for 50 years, I wrote this book, 40 Days on the Mountain with God, as a pastoral devotional format on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it starts before the Sermon on the Mount. So, this is not a commentary. Uh, It's designed to help people think. The questions are more important than what I say uh, because you can't get the right answers until you get the right questions. A question is a file folder in your brain. And until you get a question, then as you think, as the Spirit leads you, as God works through other people, you have a place to put things that you see and learn. Observations, thoughts, other questions. And the Sermon on the Mount became that for me. But it took me another 25 years to to come to what I thought was an understanding of the gospel of Christ. And I wrote a book that was really the first book I started called Seeing God, Seeing You. And uh, it is really kind of the best, my, my best attempt at just synthesizing a lot of that into how 
I see God seeing me. And in seeing how God sees me, I see me really, who I really am. Because I don't define me, God defines me. But it, it was only as I got that that the Sermon on the Mount started making sense. The gospel is about the good news of God. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is 2 Timothy 2. The apprentices will appreciate. We study that because it's there that Paul starts with this young pastor that he's mentored and trained named Timothy and says, Be strong then, my son, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now this word grace, we, we jump to mercy. The word grace means gift. And it is a description of God because our God is a complete giver. He needs nothing. There are things He desires that He wants, but He doesn't need that. He doesn't need us. And we were created, humanity was created as image bearers. We're not gods uh, in the sense that we're, like, we're a god, but we will one day be made into divine beings. We will become divine in the sense of we're going to take on an immortal form, this body that we have. We don't understand that. So, um, but once I got this idea, because it's here that Paul outlines very briefly what he had come to believe, and he says in that, this is my gospel. And that is the first semester assignment for the sermons for all of our apprentices. There are several in here that have preached that sermon. Kevin even did. It wasn't very good, but he did, a, he did it. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the attention off my sister because then she'll start heckling me. But, uh, you know, it's, it's grappling with what is your gospel? And, and not that it, it changes, but it's like the relationship each child has with a parent. They, they all, I'm, I'm all four of my kids' dad. I'm a, lot, I'm a spiritual dad to quite a few people in this room. But each person has a different relationship with me. It doesn't change me at all. But it's based on their need. What, what they need. For young people that don't have a dad, that role may be much more significant and meaningful for somebody that does have a dad. I'm a bit of a spiritual dad to John's kids, but they've got a great dad. They don't need that, but there's, a, there's another role. There's a backup role, a granddad kind of a role that you can have. Well, uh, as, you, as you look at this idea of this is my gospel, it's how God comes to me, how God sinks with me, how God meets my needs. What is my sin that got forgiven? Not just my sin. What are my sins he's forgiven me of? And so the more I came to understand the gospel, I heard this question about how to interpret the Sermon on the Mount because the Sermon on the Mount doesn't discuss grace. It doesn't discuss mercy. It's pretty cut and dried. And, and don't, let, don't miss the point that what you see in the Sermon on the Mount and, and what Matthew is doing, this converted tax collector, Jewish tax collector who has kept records, obviously, of what Jesus said is coming out. And he's writing this letter uh, quite a few years after the gospel had been preached uh, some of the letters had already been written. And, and along comes in about 60, 65, somewhere in there, these, these gospel accounts. So the gospel is already out there. The church was already formed by people coming to faith, accepting the gospel of Christ, and coming to Him. It was already out there. So this letter is, is specifically targeting Jews that had become Christians uh, and, and speaking their language. So he lays this out, tracing the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Abraham, and makes that point. And then he, you see these uh, uh, anti-types, if you know Scripture, the, the shadows are what was going on in the Old Testament, but a shadow in, in this vernacular is like if, if you're standing on this side of the building and we're talking and we're waiting on John to get here, one minute, okay, and then he walks down there, I ask him to do this, 
okay? Because this is my life and I could talk for five hours about this subject. But we see John walking, the sun's way over there. We see a shadow coming down the road. And if you know John, I could probably recognize John's gait, his walk, you know, his slick head, you know, coming down there. Uh, but, but the reality is when John comes around the corner, now we see John. And what we have in the Old Testament is God is coming. Emmanuel is coming. And all of these things that are happening in the Old Testament are this shadow, and that's what we're seeing, is this shadow coming. And when Jesus shows up, we see God uh, uh, showing up. So Jesus, you know, 40 days in the wilderness, and he did beat Satan. The Jews were 40 years in the wilderness and lost. You know, there were 12 tribes. He picks 12 apostles. Don't lose these, these meanings because they're deeply rooted in God's history with us. So that's what we're dealing with. And when you come to this, you say, oh, this is a big deal. What's getting ready to happen, he's now going up on the mountain just as Moses had gone up and gotten the, the, um, the, the, the law. But what we're going to see here when they say he spoke as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. What are they saying? The teachers of the law were quoting prophets. Thus saith the Lord. That's what they were quoting. They were quoting tradition. Jesus was saying, you have heard it said. And then he quoted what they had told them. He said, but I say. But I say. And it's like, wait a minute, he's not quoting anybody. He's saying, this is what I say. He is speaking as God. And so when you come to this, what you see is Jesus is not delivering the gospel. He is the gospel. Matthew is not rewriting the gospel. Here, Jesus is the gospel. What the Sermon on the Mount is, is now you've received the gospel. How do you live gracefully? How do we live this out? And when you figure that out, suddenly you're not feeling guilty every time you read Blessed are the Poor in Spirit and you think, I don't even know what the crap that means, let alone am I? You know what I'm saying? You're thinking, oh, okay. We can yeah. talk about that. Is it no cussing in our sermons, okay? So Is crap cussing? That's cr- yeah, that's cussing, right, Joy? When John yeah. first started yeah. preaching... Stop, okay, we don't have time. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> So I what, literally what, would have to turn his mic off. Turn his to mic keep off. Him from getting in trouble. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm going to read the the beatitudes here, and what I want is for you, as you hear these, I'd like for you. To, we can't. We don't have time to speak on all of them, but just the one that stands out the most to you, and then I will. <laughs> okay. I know it's a tall tall order, but uh, oh, and this is your water. This is for you. Thank you, Matt, for thinking of that. But um, yeah, so let me read these. And then again, uh, the one that stands out the most to you, I'm going to ask you a question on that. So the first question will be, which one stands out the most to you? And then I'll ask a follow-up question. You guys can follow along in Matthew 5 in your Bible. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, so which one stands out to you most? (laughs) I know each one of those is a sermon. Okay. (laughs) They're they're part and parcel together, and that's the problem. When you try to parse these, you you damage them. And I know what you're Mm. asking, and that's fair, but, but... Okay, well then that's, let let me stop you right there. So let's just take that route then. Instead of trying to drill down into one specifically, why don't you talk just a little bit about how we should think about the Beatitudes in our lives as a whole? And are there character qualities to develop through spiritual disciplines, litmus tests of the kingdom life for us? Are there something else? Like talk to us about just kind of the overall structure. And I'm going to give you 10 minutes on this one. 
I believe the Sermon on the Mount is not a single sermon. I think what he's saying is he began to teach them saying, this, is, this was the grace message that was being delivered throughout his whole ministry. Do I believe there was a time he delivered initially this? Yeah, I do. That's what he's saying. But he began to teach them saying, this is the start of his teaching ministry. And so, you know, when you walk with Jesus and you start studying this, he's just beginning to teach you. You think you can go through and read a commentary and get these? You're, you're, you can't. This is the nature of God. And you've got to just repent and believe the gospel and then walk by the Spirit. These changes do not come about through spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines just prepare us to receive the Spirit of God. You know, what Paul says, beholding His glory, we're being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory. And all of this is from God who is the Spirit. The Spirit is the wind, the, the move, the energy that's coming in that transforms us. All of this is from God, who is the Spirit. So, so ours is not a doing, it's a yielding. It's not a conquering, it's a surrendering. So when he starts, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's just stating, this is who God is. Your attitude must be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. This is God, the exact representation of God. You know, come to me, you that are weary and burdened. I am meek and lowly in heart. We've got this high and mighty view of God that comes directly from evil. That is not God. Our God leads from down here. So for him to just come out and say, blessed are the poor in spirit, this is the kingdom of heaven. He's just stating, you're not going to be in the kingdom of God if you don't empty yourself. And that's what poor in spirit is about. It's about, you know, the people that were listening to Jesus were poverty stricken people. They were desperate people. We don't see that kind of desperation in our country much. But you go in some of the other parts of the world and you'll see it. People that are hurting, they're sick, they don't have food, they can't feed their kids, they're, they're in trouble. That's who's listening to this sermon. And you've got to get in their skin a little bit to get this, that he He's saying, you're blessed in the condition you're in because we don't. You know, you guys can whine because you're not sure where you're going to meet next week. You're going to meet somewhere and it will have heat and air conditioning. You know what I'm saying? We're okay. And God wants us to do that. That's why when Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to deny yourself and take up a cross. One of the things I've been teaching in track is so many of these young men particularly come in uh, looking pretty rowdy, and the, but they've got a cross on. And, and I've started saying, if you're going to wear that cross, you need to bear that cross. You know, you've got to bear it. It's not just a trinket. That means something. This is what our God did for us. This is what love is about. It's about self-sacrifice. You've got to start there. Whoever wants to gain their life will lose it. So that's what he's getting at. You know, bl blessed are those that mourn. That just, we're, our whole goal is God wants me to be happy. Um, okay, I can't cuss. So I can say that's BS, okay? Um, you know, we all know it what really that means. does deserve stronger language. And our, our Bible, by the way, uses impolite language. Again, read read Leviticus, but, uh, you know, the, but there's the point. This is crazy, but he's saying it's the kingdom of God is upside down to the world. It really is right side up and the world is upside down. It's, it's in being able to recognize any moment that you're living in the lap of luxury, there are kids starving to death. There are people that are miserable. They're hurting. There are people like me that was laying in bed as a sophomore and I'm lost. And then I go to church just dying to ask somebody some questions. Is this normal? And nobody comes up and says, hey, son, what you dealing with? You know, you, I had to force conversations with people that were awkward just to try to let off some of this and find out. We want you to be able to talk to somebody. Bring it. You're not going to shock us. You know, so blessed are the mourners, blessed are the meek. This is talking about power under control, not shyness or timidity. You know, they're going to inherit the earth. Why? Because you're going to be with God. He is the king. You know, 
And you get with him and you give yourself to him and you're on the winning team and you don't have to do anything. You just throw him the ball. You're going to win. That's it. I'll take, you know, any of the pro basketball players. We'll use LeBron. I'll take LeBron and I'll take any 10 of you on in basketball. You know, because I know that I can throw him the ball over you and he's going to score and it's tough. I don't have to do anything but get him the ball. That's the way it is with God. Get him the ball. Give him the ball, and then whatever happens is going to be good. It's just going to work out. And, and that's this whole thing about being hungry, because it's in our emptiness that we turn to God, and the Spirit fills us. You know, each one of these is so important, being merciful. You know, you're going to get judged by the, how you judge other people. People are so graceful to me. I had a, I had a lady call me last night. She said, my husband's getting ready to take me to the hospital. And I just called you. He doesn't know who's on the phone yet. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, he thinks I'm going to kill myself. And I said, why? She said, because I drove in my garage and got home. And she's just got a problem with a kid. She said, I closed the garage and rolled my windows down and left the car running. And I said, how long were you in it? And she said, 20 minutes. And I said, and you're wondering why he thinks you're going to kill yourself? <laughs> you tried to kill yourself. You know, she said, you're the only person that can get me straight. She, she said, you're the least judgmental person I've ever known. Now, that doesn't mean I don't mean judgments, but it's just being the gospel to people. So, you know, when, when you get mercy, it's like, who am I going to judge? You know, so it, it's, there's a blessing in this. You get to help people. You get to help people. And you can share this gospel of God with people. And pure in heart is just talking about, I don't, I don't live for anything else. I don't got nothing else. You want to know me? It's this. This is what I live for. And I've been doing it a long time. Whoever has suffered in the flesh is done with sin. You're just done. I mean, I don't sin. I just, I, that, that's not what I live for anymore. And that's what pure in heart means. And then you become a peacemaker, but a peacemaker between God and humans. And the ultimate peace between humans is the peace you find in God. And then you're going to get persecuted. The same people that would, would call me not judgmental, there's people that throw their books down and walk away and call me ugly names. And I, it's not that I don't ever deserve any of that, but so it's, yeah. So these, this is all part and parcel of who God is. This is God. Now, not hungering and thirst in the sense that he's hungry for it. It is what he is. I could go on. Thank you. Um, so that next section there uh, is titled Salt and Light. And Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, how, should it, how shall its saltiness be restored? Um, and then it says, it talks about being the light of the world. And a city set on a hill can't be hidden. So um, just kind of looking at that section... Um, just talk a little bit about that and, and challenge us specifically on our saltiness and, and what that looks like for us. Well, for them, salt represented life. And um, if you, you, you see this very well depicted in the story of Gandhi because that was really the battle between Gandhi and the British. They wouldn't let them make salt and they needed salt to live. Uh, the Bible is about life. You've got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, and, and everything rests on that. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents self-reliance, trying to play God, trying to figure it out. The tree of life represents just trusting God. And it's been that way the whole time. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. No one was ever saved by law. The problem is the tree of life represents law. It's just God. It's who God is. Good is, go is what God is. Evil is anything opposed to him. That's pure and simple. The law of Moses was a mere representation of it in the sense of you want to live by this? Let me show you. You can't. That's why God said the day you eat this fruit, you're going to die. Why? Because you're going to try to get it yourself. You're going to unplug from God and you're going to try to plug into other things. You've got to plug into God. God is good, infinitely good. Our whole world is about energy. It's about energy. You study quantum mechanics. It's about everything is, has quanta of energy. And there's an equivalent amount of energy in mass. 
And that's what E equals MC squared was about. We are about energy. And this energy derives itself from this energy that is God, this power, this glory. Our Bible speaks in that terms. And that is life. We get life from this power. We are not energy sources. We're energy receivers and transmitters. And, and so when we come to Christ, we are given this gift of God in us, which is our hope of glory. And, and what we are then is we are this givers of this life. We're the preservers. When you walk in the room, I don't care how weak you are, if you're a believer, you bring God. You don't just bring an idea of God, you bring God. Out of their hearts will erupt rivers of living water, and that's as much by grace as anything. That God has sanctified you. That God consecrates you through faith, and therefore His Spirit gushes from you. Unless you dam the river up and you, you let that go, we're the salt. We preserve, we bring taste. And you know, he says, if it, if, it, it's, if it loses its saltiness, of course, they're thinking in terms of what they had as salt, which was impure, but what was left, if it got washed out, they would take that then. It lost its preservative ability, its seasoning ability, and they would throw it on the walkway. And that's this idea of what salt losing its saltiness. And, and we can do that. We just get washed out. We walk in, we don't got nothing. We just don't have Him. And that's why we're to walk in the Spirit. And that's about faith, not thinking, look how good I am. What the instructions that we get in the Scriptures are about how to do that. How to walk in the Spirit. So, you're, you're, you're the light of the world. Again, there's energy, power, the ability to see. We don't see things. We see light. I don't see you. I see the light reflecting off of you. And, and that's what energy is about. Those photons are causing, igniting the electrons on the surface and it's giving off this energy and our brain is receiving it and it's trying to figure out what it's looking at. It's all about energy. He's saying you're the light of the world. We give off this energy. We ignite things so that people can see things. You know, at my age, I get up in the night and I'll, I'll press my phone button and get the light on. I can see so I don't stub my toe. I don't run into something. It's, it, it doesn't take a lot. But he's saying a city on a hill. You know, we grew up in the country where there were no street lights. When there wasn't a moon, it was dark. And dad wouldn't let us leave a light on in the house. It was scary. You couldn't see anything. And, and I would lie awake at night if I'd get scared and just hope a car would come by and shine their lights through and I could look around the room and make sure the monster wasn't in there. Um, that's what he's saying you are. It's people traveling and they're out there. They need water. They need food. They're, you know, they don't have their GPS. Uh, they don't have an iPhone. And they come up over the hill and they see a light on a hill over there. See, there's hope. There's safety. There's food. There's water. And that's what he's, he's picturing. He's saying, and you don't, you, you've got to put your light on a lampstand. But guys, it's not, look how good I am. It's look how graceful I am. It's look how humble I am. Look, I've got God. What do you got? This is what I got. It's when the, 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 the crippled guy asked, you know, Peter and John, a poor guy for money. And, and they, he, they said, we don't have any silver or gold. But what we have, we're going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. That's what we've got to give, is hope and healing and help. And sometimes it's just listening to somebody for the first time, without judgment, letting them pour out what they've been through, what's happened to them, what they've done all those things that people come that cause them to be weary and burdened. And that's who we are. And then he says, and let your light shine. So they see your good deeds. This is not about being showy. Because it's about pointing people to God. That's good. Thank you.
Um, so we get into this next kind of uh, these next groups here where and you touched a little bit on this uh, with Jesus saying you've heard it said this but I say this and he kind of goes back through different things in the law it talks about anger lust divorce oaths retaliation um, so in each of those sections he starts off saying um, you've heard it said this but I tell you this and he's comparing two different things can you talk just a little bit about what he's doing there, not specifically about each one of them individually, but just as a whole, what he's trying to do there? And if you could just spend four or five minutes on this, and I want to spend our last section on uh, love your enemies. Um, well, he's dislodging them. Um, Satan is a false prophet. And in, in all of our lives, there are things that we have been taught that are patently wrong. Um, I, I was patently taught that God is poor in mercy. You got to really work for it. You got to be really good. And I, it, it was burdensome. And then, you know, as I came to understand the gospel, I started, I would read things like what Paul writes in Ephesians, but God, who is rich in mercy, took wait. Hmm. Now what? Let me read that again. And, and so... The Jews really, they didn't read the Bible. They didn't have it. They had to go to the synagogue to get to hear Scripture read. And that's all they had. And so they would, they would go listen to it, but then they had to go ask the teachers of the law what the Bible even said, because they couldn't look it up. And so what they knew was what they had heard. That's all they knew, is what they had heard. There were only a select few people that could read the Scripture. And so, he said, you have heard it said. Well, some of what they heard was out of the Bible, but some of what they heard was patently not from God. And, and that's why Jesus had challenged them in, in, in Matthew 26 about that. You guys are tithing mint and dill and cumin, but you're neglecting the important things to God. And it's the same thing Micah had said. God has already shown you what he requires to do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with God. But you're not doing this. You're robbing fields from widows. This is where you get. That's why the church takes on and religion takes on so much egg on our faces because we deserve it. We bind heavy burdens on people and we're not even lifting them. And that's why when we see our famous preachers fall, we're all aghast. Well, they're just like us. You know, they may be very sincere, but too many times they've been the ones that have, have really gotten on people. And, 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 but they're guilty. They're sinners too. And when they get caught, they're judged with the same judgment they've judged other people because they've acted like they were good. So what Jesus is doing is dislodging them. You've heard it said, don't kill. But I'm saying when you're, you're holding anger toward your brother, you're killing them. You've heard it said, don't look lustfully at another. And this word lust, by the way, we are very hung up from our Victorianism about sex. God can handle your sexuality. You know, He, he can handle it. What He can handle is your greed and your selfishness and your anger and your bitterness and your meanness. God understands when God said be fruitful and multiply, He meant it. And He made us a bunch of horny toads. And we've got to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? It is a difficult thing. And God can handle that. He wants you to learn how to handle it. You know what I'm saying? But, but He can handle it. But what we're sitting there sometimes trying to hold in our sexuality, which, which needs to be restrained. But, but in doing that, we're knocking people's heads off with beams sticking out of our eyes and of our greed and our selfishness and our racism and our meanness and our self-righteousness before the world. We're binding these things on people and then hear gospel in it. Gospel changes us. So Jesus is saying, you've heard it said, but I'm going to tell you, here's the deal. You've heard it said, you don't commit adultery. I'm saying when you start lusting, you're already doing that in your heart. You know, it's what's going on inside that is mattering. And you need to look inside and you're going to see what's coming out. It's not what goes into us that defiles us. It's what's coming out of us. But only the Spirit of God and the Word of God can change that. 
And so, you know, he, he goes through these, each one of these things and kind of lays it out. You have heard it said, but I'm saying. He's saying, God is saying this. Now listen to him. This is the God of grace. That's good. Um, we're going to close out with this, this love your enemies uh, uh, section here in 43 through 48. And if you just give some kind of overall thoughts on that and, uh, and specifically just the challenge of, of today's kind of culture and climate where it's, there's so much division and so, much, um, so, so many opportunities to, to be at odds with people, right? And so, you know, what is the lesson we can take from this section to really try and, and, uh, and be the salt and light that, that he was talking about earlier? And again, I'll give you about five minutes on this one, and then we're going to wrap up. Well, I, I try to tweak arrogance regularly, but I, uh, I said it, and there were some people raised their eyes the first time I said it, but the study of theology is often ultimately an over-analysis of ambiguous things to the neglect of obvious things. That's why you can see very, very knowledgeable people biblically who just aren't loving. They're not kind. They're not humble. Wait, what are we doing here? Well, what are we doing? And that's why we ought to walk in our churches and see very caring, loving. And I'm not talking about people, greet your neighbor. It's people that really care. You know, we don't have to be told. We're looking for somebody to care about. We're servants. None of us are, none of us are customers here. We're all, we're all workers. You know what I'm saying? We're stalkers. We're servers. We, we don't say, it's over there. We take them over there. This is my job. We bring it. We've got the Spirit of God in us. There's something that you could do today that likely no one else could do it like you could do. You just need to find who that's with. And, and what he's saying is, you know, if, if you love people that love you, you're just like the world. And so much of our... Our Christianity is just tainted by worldliness. It's selfishness. I want to sit where I want to sit. I want to be around people that I want to be around. Let somebody else clean up the vomit. You know, let somebody else pick up the trash. And what he's saying is that's not who God is. He seeks out people. He died. He wants to help people. He energizes. We are carrying this energy into life. And when we look at somebody, when we speak to somebody, when we care about somebody, I don't believe I can, can speak to Oscar because I'm good. But I think Oscar knows I can look at him and he knows I care about him. And that I would do a lot for him. And you know, I could go around the room. It's that way. When, when we look at people, we ought to be turning the laser love of God on them. Because it's not really what have we done for people. It's what would you do for them? What would you do? And that's what God wants us to be is those people that would die for people. Because that's our legacy of the real Christians. It was the Christians that were going and getting people out of the gutter during the plague when they were throwing these people that were still alive out there, and they were getting them and bringing them back in and taking care of them, knowing they were risking their own lives. That's what we're going to do. And in doing that, we find life. Because when Jesus said, go make disciples, teach them, and I'll be with you. Guys, you're never closer to Jesus when you're doing the Jesus deal. Your quiet time, you may be a million miles away from God. But I'm telling you, when you're loving people Jesus loves, He's with you. And He's flowing from you. And then you just want to learn more about Him, so you learn how to do that better. Because again, at, at my age, I get a lot of calls. There's a reason that lady and her husband called me last night. She said, you're the only person that can put me straight. Now, I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying you can be that person for someone. You can be the one that when they think they're most desperate, I'm going to call. You know, I have a poem called, I Will Go to Jesus. And when you, when you figure that out, when you're just empty, you think, I'm going to go to Jesus. I'm going to go talk to him. And so, you know, if, 
That's what he's getting at. Here's the real test. The more you know God, the more you love people. Now, this is not human love first. This is the love of God. It's the will what's right for people. It's not about your sentiment. It's not about your feeling. You can love people that you don't like. And that's what he's talking about loving your enemies. He's not saying love these despicable people who may be trying to kill you. He's not saying like them. He's saying you do what's right toward them. That's what, that's what we're going to do. That's good. Thank you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, Cole, will you grab the communion trays on your way up? And then I'm going to invite the praise team to come up too. Um, so we're going to combine our last song and our communion uh, time together. So uh, you heard a lot. Uh, just then, and uh, a lot of great info. And Matt, would you mind putting the chairs back for me? John, too, yeah. if people want okay. one of these, I'm going to put this paper here. Put your name on it, okay. and I'll order them. They're like four bucks, but if you can't afford one, just put your name down, and James will pay for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so as the communion trays go by, uh, grab a little stack of cups and um, hang on to that. As you probably know by now, that's our, our bread and juice, and this is a representation of, of God's love for us, uh, his broken body, his shed blood, and, uh, and the victory that we have uh, in all of that. So um, a lot of just really great information in that uh, first, first talk today. And so I want to give you a chance to, to think about that. So William, I'm going to call a little audible here and throw you a curveball. Uh, would you sing some of the song here and then uh, leave a break in the middle uh, and maybe just play lightly for a minute or so while people uh, think about both the song and the talk? And then if you'll close it uh, with a prayer and sing the rest of the song, then we can stand up for that second half. Is that cool? Does that make sense? For sure. Okay. Thanks, guys.